month, Scott brought in this brochure and left it on the back table about the <coughs> Nakashima exhibit at the James A. Mitchner um, uh, Museum. And uh, so my wife and I were interested, or I was interested, and my wife Thank decided you. to come along. So uh, it's in uh, Doylestown, PA. I don't know where you're living, but basically Doylestown is about 20 minutes on Route 202 past the Lambertville, uh, Delaware Water Gap crossing. Uh, 202 is a single road, lots of traffic. It's not near Delaware Water Gap. It's right, Lamberville, New Hope. Lamberville, New Hope. It's not Delaware near the Water Gap. Oh, sorry. Oh, way, river. way south right. of the Water Gap. Water Gap is about 75 right. miles right. north of that. Okay, I'll go with it. <laughs> edit that? <laughs> yes. So, so anyway, <laughs> we'll edit that out. <laughs> it's, Take it's, two. This is a nice little museum. Um, it's not particularly large, but uh, what they were running was uh, the George uh, Nakashima exhibit, and then they also had a chair exhibit which oddly enough was the same chair exhibit I saw about two years prior at the Reading Museum. So uh, it's, it's a nice little museum. It's quite uh, easily uh, done in an hour, hour and a half maybe at the most, depending upon how much time you want to spend. And uh, so this is the first area about Nakashima. Now everybody knows Nakashima's work, but uh, just I'm going to bore you with uh, the Nakashima story. Uh, Nakashima was born in 1905. He was from Spokane, Washington. Uh, 1905 was pretty rural out there, so he worked early on in his career uh, in, in forestry. He worked on the railroad, uh, and then he went to the University of Washington and became an architect. Uh, he graduated in 1929, and then after graduation, he went to MIT, where he got a master's in architecture. So once he graduated from MIT, he sold everything he had, and he bought a ticket on a tramp steamer and went to Europe. He went to Europe, he went to North Africa, and he just basically tramped his way around until he came to Japan, where he proceeded to work for a couple years. Um, he worked for a guy by the name of Anton Ronin, uh, Antony Ronin, and uh, he was ran an architectural firm. And so uh, Nakashima rose through the ranks for a couple years, and in 1937, by 1937, he was running a program in Pondicherry, India, where he was in charge of building a dormitory, and that's where he did some initial design work on furniture. Hmm. Uh, he left uh, he left India and uh, came back to Japan, and he met his wife Marion in Japan. In 1939, he left Japan and came back to the United States. Uh, he didn't want to pursue architecture at that point, so he was teaching furniture making out on the West Coast in Spokane. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he left in 39. In 1940, he came back, and in 1942, uh, he went to an internment camp in Idaho. Um, at that point in time, he met a, uh, a professionally trained or, or classically trained uh, craftsman, a Japanese craftsman, who taught him how to use hand tools and taught him to have reverence for what he was doing and, most important, have patience. So he, he did that uh, for a period of time while he was, he was interred. But uh, what happened was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was much opposed to uh, the internment. So she convinced FDR to start to basically parole these people with sponsorship. So Antonin Ronin sponsored Nakashima, and he brought him to his, his facility in New Hope, PA. Uh, Nakashima then worked at a chicken farm for two years. Uh, he also then continued to do design work on furniture, and he was working for a company called Knoll, K-N-O-L-L, -L, and apparently he had some interesting designs, but uh, the thing that really made it for him was that Nelson Rockefeller was a fan of uh, Japanese and Asian artwork, and so he commissioned Nakashima for 200 pieces for his home somewhere in the Hudson River Valley area. So. George was already on his way. So that's basically what's, uh, what's on this, this chart to the side. So, so when you go into the museum, the first thing you come across is the permanent room with uh, the Nakashima table and Nakashima, Nakashima chairs. And I'm sorry this is so fuzzy, but, um, but those are his things. Now, it just so happens when I was going through this, and I was, I was looking, I came across a website for an auction house. And if you want to buy eight of those chairs, they're available for the mere price of $24,000. So pony up your a piece spare or change. For, or for the set. For all eight. It's all eight. Yeah. It's, oh, it's a bargain. Three, three grand a piece. So. 
they stop they that? From his hand, or yeah, no, they're his. From, yeah. This is this is misplaced. This is was basically a cabinet that was put in there, and uh, this is a Wharton Escher. I'm sorry, I screwed up. This should have been on on a different area, but it's still still good stuff. Uh, this is the uh, the piece that you come across as you as you walk into this room in which displays the Nakashima work. Uh, this is the the bench, which is which is rather enormous. The uh, dimensions on this thing this thing is 85 inches wide. Wow! Um, so you can sit a family on this thing, but it's 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 just it's gorgeous in its mass and its subtlety. So it, it's really an interesting piece. Uh, these are some other pieces. This is this is the music stand. Um, now he, his daughter Mira played instruments, so hence the music stand. And this was the chair to go go along with that because it was designed because of the motion of being musician. I guess the the moving. I don't know what instrument she played, but but the little little blurb says that it's designed to accommodate the motions of a musician as they play. Hmm. Uh, this is another chair. This was supposed to be a school chair, apparently at some point. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm surprised about the depth of these chairs, how, how low they are. Hmm. Again, here, here we have more Nakashima. This is, this is the Mira chairs. Again, this is for his daughter. Uh, this is a walnut and poplar. And apparently the poplar was used for uh, other people's uh, uh, products when he sold them, whereas the seats on this one are, uh, for his daughter are walnut, which was apparently, you know, obviously harder to work. Right, Matt? <laughs> so anyway, this this was set for his daughter. This is uh, his wife's work. This is Ma uh, Marion's work, and uh, she took over for a period of time. It's now run by the daughter, and this is a huge piece. I don't know what the dimensions of it is, but it's it's a full full. I would say it's a equivalent to a you know a sofa of, of any magnitude, and you can see the structure that's required to hold this slab. And the premise on this slab of why she chose it, according to the little, little tag, was that this element supposedly represented a dragon's head to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you oh, can yeah. see that, mm -hmm. you've got a career in picking out slabs. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little blurb about Mira, who's now running the business. And, uh, and I guess the, the New Hope uh, place is still, still cooking away. These are some of the other pieces that were scattered throughout the building. Um, this is uh, what you come across when you come walking in. And these are massive pieces. This is done by a guy by the name of Robert Whitley. Now, apparently Mark has met Robert yeah. at some point. Uh -huh. yeah. I bought some of his wood. He's great. You bought some of his wood? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I've met him, too. Oh, well, look. Bring him in. But anyway, these pieces are massive. I mean, this, this bench was sitting in, they call it a throne bench, which is, is, is pretty appropriate because this is rather massive. And the throne desk is, is basically mimicking the same, same kind of, uh, of structure with the legs and the, and the curves and whatnot. But uh, curly maple, black walnut, and bird's eye. So it, it's really pretty wood. But boy, you need a big space to, to house one of those things. Um, it's actually interesting that, you know, this is the advertisement for the Nakashima exhibit. This is a Robert Whitley piece. <laughs> and this is a desk. Now, unfortunately, they, they don't have it open, but I'd be curious to see what would be on the inside of that. It's, a, it's characterized as a starfish desk. And then this is just a chair, I guess, to go with uh, those rather ponderous desks and, that he made. Wow. <clears throat> okay, here's Wart Nesherick. Um, this is... Uh, a stool that he made, and it's alleged to be one of his high volume products, which I don't know what the volume means. I mean, probably a couple dozen. However, I did happen to find this one in, all, in another uh, another auction, and they're going for fourteen thousand. So, so clearly the you know, you know the Nakashima chairs are a much better bargain. This this is his library stool, which is absolutely really stunning because you've got. A, a rounded step, and then the the long stabilizing beam that you can hold on to twists. So the flats twist from this to this to this to that. So as you as you would step up, it would twist accordingly. And the story on this is very simply that there was a neighbor that apparently has a variety of his pieces that he used to go over and drink. And uh, 
She had uh, a book, you know, she's one of these people who loves books and got books vertically stacked everywhere in the house. And so she complained she couldn't reach the top shelf. So behold, he went and created this and, and started to knock them out, like probably maybe three or four. <laughs> but anyway, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's so fluid. And the, and the, the tapering on the legs is, is different on each leg. Um, but it, it's, it's so incredibly creative and, and delicate, but hopefully strong enough to stand on. Yeah, and not tip over. <laughs> that would be a good idea. This is, is Sam Maloof. So this chair does not show how beautiful it is with this picture. I mean, this, the joints on this thing are just spectacular. I mean, the, this seat has about six different pieces of, of curly maple, or, uh, and one, two, three, four, five, six pieces that go across the bottom, and the back splats are just tapered in a variety of ways to accommodate the spine. It's just drop-dead gorgeous, and the, and the finish on it it's so delicate, but I mean, it's it's just so fluid. It, it's really beautiful. Um, as I said, there was a, a chair exhibit going on, and this is the chair that I found to be most appealing. In this is this is obviously a colonial chair. This is uh, you know it's a it's a comb back uh, Windsor armchair, and I, I just think those Windsor chairs are just gorgeous. So that's why I took that. Some of the other chairs. That, the reason I remember the exhibit was there were some chairs that you literally could not sit on because they were just such design statements of, of gears and whatnot, and, and curved bamboo and all sorts of other crazy stuff, and vibrant colors. But I mean, this was the piece that I thought was most interesting. So throughout the museum, there are a couple of other items. I, I thought these were particularly interesting. This is a, a fireplace wall. Some gorgeous wood in it. The colors, the colors of, of cherry just pop right out. And this, this is sort of a Moroccan or, or you know, a very uh, graphic kind of kind of uh, uh, changes of shapes and whatnot. Wow. And somewhere in the middle of here, you can see there's a, a central doorknob. We would like wow. to open it, but there are people around. And the people oh, those are by it. Phil Powell. They <coughs> both are? Yeah. So. Terrific. They, I mean, this uh, is really gorgeous. That's stunning. That's about that. hey, Robert. Sure. So uh, the measuring exhibit is fantastic, but I just want to point out, and, uh, I've done it now twice, but in this area, because we're so close to Escherich and uh, Nakashima workshops and uh, uh, Powell and some others, that in addition to seeing them in museums and exhibits, I mean, uh, Scott Fulmer and I, on a couple of occasions now, have gone to some of the auction houses. And if you keep an eye on Rego in uh, Lambertville or uh, there's another one, Freeman's in Philadelphia, you can see some of this stuff in person. Because it's on auction, you can sit in it, pick it up, turn it upside down. Uh, you can take measurements off the of spindles if you want, um, and often they have they have some of that stuff. So good. Is it still Rago? I, I thought they I thought they moved out. Later. No, they they now have two buildings in that. Oh, they do. Very good. This is the last item. This was in the hallway on the way in. Um, this is a guy by the name of Frederick William Marrer rather linear and square, but it's a very interesting veneers up there. Overall, it's a lovely place to go. There's a little coffee shop in there, that, and they've got a lovely courtyard sit outside. There's a wonderful library that's affiliated with it, even larger than scale than the, uh, than the museum, I would say. Um, and they, they had some interesting things that were on exhibit uh, previously, so I just suggest uh, you know, you keep your eyes out for what might be going on in that area. And this is clearly something worth visiting because it's on until July 7th. Uh, and just to add to what you're saying is the, Mer uh, the Michener Museum is right across the street from the Mercer Museum, right. which is a unique building in itself, housing some unique um, 18th century uh, stuff. Well, there's really also, cool. I mean, there's a, there's a tile works place in that area. Yeah, the Monrovia tile works. There's, there's, yeah. it's, it's an interesting area to go to. I mean, Doylestown has another, another, you know, a couple decent little places to have something to eat. So. Yeah, Fond Hill's right there. Fond Hill, right. Which is the home, home of Mercer. Right. So, there's lots to do in the area. So, All right, thank you, Rob. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.
So it sounds like a good day trip then. You go, you oh, can yeah. hit one in the morning. And right across the place the, you mentioned. Huh? Literally so right across the street. You don't even have to move your car, just walk across yeah, yeah, the street. Generous parking here, so just yeah. park on one you know. Yeah. It's great. Actually, you can do all three. Yeah, can we? Are you? Yes. Mercer experimented with four concrete. I got you. I got a sub-drive. Oh, no. I, 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 all right. Hey, Mom. Mom. You watching me? Is it okay for me to record? Am I doing all right? I want to go back to our PowerPoint. Mark has a few slides on it. What's up, Paul? I just want to mention that in addition to what he said about all the interesting things there in New Hope and Doylestown, if you go up uh, 611 a little further north of Doylestown and they got Hickok Lumber Company, which sells lumber from trees, so they got fresh cut oak and poplar and different kinds of wood if they have it. They're right up there north on 611, but it's all rough slush and green. <laughs> Start from the slide. All right, thanks, Walt. <laughs> Security is like the, the bottom. Okay. The, the, the I don't see it on my screen. No, you got to look there. Drive on that. Uh, Frank, I don't.